Thank you, Gary, for leading in Jim's absence. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Chuck, for leading us in worship this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we enter into his word. God, thank you for being spilled out and broken for us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for a reminder this morning through worship that this is not our home, that we're living for a day where we'll see you face to face, worship you in a place called glory, a place called heaven forever, where there'll be no sun, there will never be night, no more night, no more pain. Thank you for the book of John that you've given us. Help us to understand it this morning, that we live in an evil world and that we're hated by the world in which we live as we follow you. So encourage us this morning to remember that we're not citizens of this world, we're citizens of heaven. In your holy name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, we are back in our series through the Gospel of John, or in what's called the Upper Room Discourse. We'll be in John chapter 15, about halfway through that chapter. We'll pick up in verse 18 and go into chapter 16, verse 4. If, if you remember, before we had the backlog service and Mother Day, Mother's Day emphasis the last two Sundays, we looked at John chapter 15. We looked at the first 17 verses where Jesus says, He's the vine. And we're the branches. That if we remain in him, he remains in us. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that comes and lives inside of us and makes us different from this lost world in which we live. And because that's true, the very next part of Scripture talks about how the world will hate us because we're followers of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that, just look at what's going on in our world today. As we stand for what God's Word says... How the world attacks the church for standing on the Word of God. We're going to look at it this morning three different ways from the text. There's many ways the world hates us for following Jesus Christ. We're just going to look at three of those from our focal text this morning. Let me read that to you again. John chapter 15 verse 18. You should have a sermon note in your handout if you'd like to take that out with a copy of God's Word. If the world hates you... Know that it hated me before it hated you, Jesus says. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Verse 21 but all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. They don't know God who sent his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. I mean, how do you hate a God who is perfect? How do you hate a God who sent his only begotten son to receive the wrath that we should receive for our sins? The world has no just cause to hate Christ, and they have no uh, just cause to hate us as followers of Christ. But they do. Verse 26. But when the Helper comes... That's why we desperately need the Holy Spirit inside of us to empower us, to give us the ability to endure. Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. John chapter 16, verse 1. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. 
He's encouraging them. I'm the vine, you're the branches. When the world comes and persecutes you, don't fall away. Endure even through persecution. Verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. They will think they're helping God by persecuting his followers. Verse 3, and they will do these things because they have not known the Father, Jesus says, nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. When persecution comes, you'll remember these encouraging words. Because I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Jesus is getting ready to lead the disciples, go to the cross, and be persecuted on our behalf. And he gives them some encouraging words that might not sound encouraging to us today, but they are. That the world will hate us as followers of Christ, but God will be with us. And these words remind us that the world will hate us without just cause. But we keep following Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Now one thing I want you to see this morning in this text is that when God saves us, he radically changes us. I mentioned it in the prayer time previously that when we were born, we were citizens of this world physically. But when we were born again, we became citizens of heaven. And this is not our home. And the sad thing is, when God saves us and radically transforms us, the world does not understand that. Because the world is living for the here and now. The world is focused on the things that are temporary. And God says our focus should not be on the things that are temporary, but the things that are eternal. Because we're living in this world, but we're not of this world because of what Christ did for us when he redeemed us and he set us free. And the world doesn't understand that. It makes no sense to the world. Let's look at three points this morning. I'm going to show you all three points on the screen right now, and then I'm going to walk back through those, okay? I just used my name, RC, for the RC point this morning. I'm just kidding. My twin brother had a girl he was dating in college that bought him an RC cola and put it in the mailbox at our house and had a note on it that said, me and my RC. That's pretty cheesy, ain't it? These just happen to be RCs, okay? First, we have a radical conflict. We have a radical change. We have a radical challenge. A radical conflict, a radical change, a radical challenge. We have a radical conflict because we live in the world, but we're not of the world. And the reason we have that radical conflict as believers with the lost world is because we've had a radical change take place in our life when God saved us radically transformed us from being of the world to in the world, but no longer of the world, citizens of heaven. But that presents to us this morning a radical challenge to live against the hatred of this lost world with the Holy Spirit's power flowing through us so that we can be one as a church as God's called us to be out of Ephesians chapter 4. That's why it's so pivotal for us this morning to be unified. We can't have division in the church because we have enough hatred outside the walls of the church that are attacking us who do not want us to live for the one true God. Radical conflict is the first point this morning. Radical conflict. Conflict. I don't want a person that walked in this place this morning who is considering what it means to be a follower of Christ, who might not be saved this morning and they're considering it, to be dealt a lie and told if you come to Jesus Christ, everything's going to be perfect for you. You will not have any problems. You won't have anything to suffer through. That is not the truth of God's holy word. The scriptures are clear. When God changes you out of this world, when he justifies you, when he transforms you, you will be persecuted by this lost and dying world. But the one who was persecuted more than will ever be persecuted, who we were not with when he was persecuted on the cross, is with us while we go through persecution. So when you come to Christ, you get everything. It doesn't mean life will be easy, but it means one day, as we sung earlier in the service, we can rejoice because we're going to go to heaven one day and we're going to rejoice with him and the things that are temporary on this world will not matter when it comes to that day, the day that Christ comes to call us home. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you. That's not saying they might not hate you. That's the pleasant way of saying 
they will hate you. It's just when they will hate you. If the world hates you, know that it hated me, Jesus says, before it hated you. That we're in great company when the world hates us as followers of Christ because they hated our Savior to the point that they crucified him on a cross when he was the sinless Son of God. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12 in your handout and on the screen. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you allow the Holy Spirit to save you, to transform you, and in the sanctification process, you're on fire for God, you truly want to live for Him, you will be persecuted. God tells us clearly in his word in 2 Timothy, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kind of false things about you. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. And so they persecute the prophets who are before you. Matthew 5, 10, 11, and 12. We will be persecuted. But Rejoice. Because this is not our home. That's why we can sing about heaven and get excited about it. Because we live in a fallen, evil world. When the president tries to put a government policy in place to mandate all public schools to have transgender bathrooms, we live in a fallen, evil world that doesn't understand what God's word says. And they're going to hate us for living for the one true God who we love, who's given everything for us, and we love him back and want to be obedient followers of his. A radical conflict. Under that point, a radical conflict, let's look at three reasons. We can look at many. Three reasons from our text that the world hates followers of Christ. Three reasons. Straight from the biblical text. Here's the first one. They do not like Christ's teachings. They don't like someone to have authority. And when Christ speaks, it's his authority. And the world wants to live for what the world wants to live for. They want to deny the word of God. There's no absolute truth in our world today because people believe their opinion supersedes the word of God. And that's what our text says. John 15 verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you, Jesus says. A servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. If we're following the word of God, we're obedient to God, but the word of God offends the lost world. They don't want anything to do with the authority of God. It goes all the way back to New Testament times. The Pharisees could not stand that Jesus had more authority than they did. Now, this is interesting because if you understood in biblical times that when a prophet spoke, any elder spoke, then he would speak. And when the the speech was over, the authority figures around would stand and say, Amen, Amen. And what that meant was we agree with what they said, so we'll put our authority stamp on it. Now listen to how Jesus spoke in the New Testament. He got up to speak and said, Amen, Amen, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you. Jesus didn't wait to speak and then have the authority figures tell him, Yes, we agree with that. Jesus got up and spoke and says, Hey, before you say anything, what I say is authority. Because I am the Son of God. It's His Word. It doesn't have to have an amen from us. It's on the authority of the very words of God. God's word says marriage between a man and a woman. Very clear in the scriptures. The Bible says homosexuality is a sin. It's very clear in the scriptures. But we live in a world that they will hate us as followers of Christ because we want to stand on the authority of the word of God. So don't be surprised. Don't be taken back. If we're obedient to the word, we will be persecuted. The question is, is do we want to be obedient to the word, even through persecution? Are we willing to stand on the authority of God's word, even through persecution, or do we fall to the trappings of this world 
because we don't want to be persecuted and give in to the world's persecution. The world will hate us because of the second point. We have a radical conflict with the lost and dying world because we've had a radical change. Second point. My prayers for you this morning is that everyone in this place has been radically transformed by the King of kings and Lord of lords. That God has truly saved your soul and taken you from a citizen of this earth to a citizen of heaven. That you don't live for the things of this world, but you live for the things that are eternal, the things that matter. And the greatest thing we can do as a church is lead others to a relationship with Jesus Christ because those things matter for eternity. Why the world hates followers of Christ, I know it's a little confusing outline and I apologize. That first point, they do not like the authority of Christ's teachings. Here's the second reason under the radical change why the world hates us as followers of Christ. Because we as followers of Christ do not belong to the world and it makes no sense to them. They can't understand why we want to gather on a Sunday and worship God. They don't understand why we give a 10% tithe to God's kingdom work, and then above that as an offering. It makes no sense to the world in which we live. And since it doesn't make sense, they persecute us for it. It's odd to them. I want you to think about when God saved you, when God transformed you, what do you see now that you didn't see when you were lost? How much has the spiritual eyes of your soul been opened up to understand that it's okay to be different from the world, that we don't have to fall into popularity or what's important to the things of the world? Now we see through the eyes of God what matters for all eternity. And when we live for that, the lost world doesn't understand. When people go to work and their job is their Lord, and they're saved, and now their job's not their boss, master, owner. They don't live just for their work, but they live for someone more important than their work, which is God. The lost world doesn't understand that. When they don't understand why you don't try to put yourself ahead to get a promotion because you're living to be a servant of the Most High King and not the things of this world, it doesn't make sense to them. Therefore, they persecute us. They don't understand what it means to be a citizen of heaven. Here's the third reason why from our text the world hates us. Let me go back. Excuse me, I didn't even give you the text for the second point. Followers of Christ do not belong to the world. Listen to it again out of John 15, verse 18. I forgot the biblical text. I'm sorry. If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, if you were still a citizen of the world, living for the things of the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you're going in the same direction as the lost world. But rather, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Because you live so different than the lost and dying world. If you want to understand what it means to be chosen out of the world, you're going to have to come on Wednesday nights as we walk through Romans 8 and 9 over the next several months. Very interesting passage about God's sovereignty, election, predestination. We'll tackle that on Wednesday night in Romans 8 and 9. We're in Romans 8 right now. But God chose us out of the world. We're no longer in the world. We're, we're in the world as followers of Christ, but this is not our home. We're not trying to build up a mass of wealth on this earth. We're trying to store up things that matter for all eternity. It's not wood, hay, and straw that's burned up on the judgment day. We're living because God changed us radically for the things this world just cannot understand. Third reason why we're hated by the world when we follow Christ is because we love the lost world and we want to share Jesus with them. And they don't like it. Because if you have to admit you need Jesus, then you have to admit there's something wrong with you without Jesus. You have to admit you have a need. You have to admit you can't do it on your own. Listen to John 16, verse 26. 
John 16, 26. But when the Helper, the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. That as followers of Jesus Christ, we're commanded to go make disciples of all nations. And as we bear witness, the lost world doesn't want to hear it. It's offensive to them. Because we're telling them they don't have the answer. And we do. And his name is Jesus. But we love them. We've come into the light from the darkness. We want them to come into the light as well. It makes very common sense to us from God's word that the world will not accept truth because they're blinded. Romans chapter 1, they're enemies of God. They're going the opposite way of God. They don't have anything to do with God. So when we tell them that they need Jesus, they think they're doing pretty good on their own. They don't really see their need for a Savior. And they base their heaven on works and everything else but what Christ did on the cross to pay for their sins. I heard this pastor was walking down the street, came across this poor animal that had its head stuck into a, what he thought was an almost empty jar of cocoa. He stuck his head in and he couldn't get his head out. And he walks up next to this animal and he realized he's trying to get something sweet that's left as a remnant in the can. But now he's stuck. And so the pastor said, this, is, this would be a great sermon illustration. Why he's sitting there watching this animal. You know, that the world, tr we tr world tries to get goodies they think are important and then get trapped by the things of the world. And then it broke his heart that he can't just sit there and think about a sermon illustration. This poor animal needs help. So he begins to reach down to help the animal out of the can. And then he realizes it's a skunk. <laughs> now he's got a dilemma. Because if he tries to liberate the skunk from the can, the skunk's not going to see it as liberation. He's got to make a decision. Do you just go ahead and free him from what's harming him, even though there's going to be severe consequences from it? That's how it is to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. When you go to the world and they don't think they need set free from anything, then they're going to fight at you because they think you're not setting them free, you're putting them in further bondage. They don't understand. I'll say this one more time. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, we physically weren't there to show our support of our Savior. But when we're being persecuted on a daily basis because the lost world hates us as followers of Jesus Christ... The Holy Spirit is in us. The helper that you see here in John 15 is with us. God never leaves us or forsakes us. He was persecuted alone, but he is with us through persecution. So we rejoice. You know why heaven is such a great place? <laughs> there will be no sin. There will be no persecution. We're persecuted for a short, brief moment on this earth, but we're living for eternity with our Savior who was persecuted beyond what we can even begin to comprehend. That leads to the third point this morning. Radical conflict of the lost and dying world in which we live because we had a radical change take place the moment God saved our soul. We have a radical challenge in front of us to live for the king in the midst of a fallen world. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. One reason why we have a radical challenge is because we have a love for God that the world doesn't understand. And we love him because he first loved us but the lost and dying world does not understand the love of God until Christ radically sets them free and saves them. You ever seen, for example, two men that are friends? One starts dating a woman, falls in love with the woman. 
He loves her with all of his heart. But his friend, who have been friends for years, can't understand why he loves her. Can't understand what he sees in her because he doesn't know her the way the one who loves her knows her. Ever seen that take place? And that friend will do everything he can to talk her out of going out with that woman or marrying that woman, and he's in head over heels in love with her, but his friend just can't see it because his friend doesn't have that relationship that they have, and he is blinded to what's going on. That's the way the lost world is. Once God set us free and saved us, we have this relationship with him and we love him and he loved us to begin with and the lost world doesn't understand that. The lost world can't comprehend that. So the only thing they know how to do is to retaliate with hate because they don't understand the love of the Savior for us and the love we have back for the Savior. Literature and history are full of examples of people who followed love and the world did not understand. To preparing to preach God's word over the last several weeks for this passage, I came across a story about the Duke of Windsor <laughs> gave up his crown to England because he fell in love with an American commoner. And if he was going to marry her, that meant he could not be the Duke of Windsor any longer. And all of his friends, all of his family ridiculed him. They could not understand. But he loved this American woman. He loved her dearly. They couldn't understand because they didn't have that love relationship that they had. Are you willing to give it all up for the love of God? Are you willing to give up the things of this world and what the world fights for so that you can live for the things that matter for eternity? The Bible is very clear. We will be persecuted. We will face persecution over and over and over again. And hear my heart. I believe it's going to get worse, not better. I know that's not encouraging to you. But we have one who's greater in us than one that's in the world. We have nothing to fear because we have Christ with us. But it's coming a day in the United States of America where anything that we preach from the scriptures that sin as sin, then we will be arrested, we'll be taken to jail. It's coming a day very, very soon. So how do we live in a fallen world? How do we live as persecuted followers of Jesus Christ? Through the hope of that Christ gives us, and by his grace and mercy every day, we fall more in love with him, and every day we, we, we fall more away from the things of the world and more towards the things that matter for eternity. Hear my heart. I am so thankful to be a citizen of the United States of America. I'm thankful for that. But hear my heart. God loves the whole world. God doesn't just love the United States of America. God loves the whole world, and he sent his son to die to make it available for anyone in the world to be saved. We think God's going to have his hand on this country just because we're the United States of America and that somehow he's got his hands against other countries. God has his hands on his people. So we live for him. Do we fight for justice in this world? Yes. Do we fight for justice in the United States? Yes. But our hope is not in the political system. Our hope is in our Savior, Jesus Christ. No matter what happens to this world, one day this world will end, and we'll be in our eternity with our Savior forever, and that's what's going to matter for all eternity, is that we're living for Him now, so when He comes one day, He'll find us faithful. As I was reading, as I love to do, I came across a story about these two Moravian missionaries. Back in the early 1800s, they had a great burden to lead a slave colony to Christ. So these two Moravian missionaries realized the only way they were going to be able to lead them to Christ is to join them as slaves. So they gave up their freedom 
and they became slaves. They gave up all the riches that they had, and they became slaves so they could lead other slaves to Jesus Christ. I think that, more than anything else I've ever heard, grabs hold of Paul's statement that I have become all things to reach all people so that I might see someone to Christ. That's an example of two missionaries who said, the trappings of this world do not matter. What matters are lost people going to come to know Jesus Christ and God's chosen to work through us as his vessels to reach a lost and dying world. So we share the love of Christ with everyone even though we know it's going to cause persecution. We go to work and we share Jesus even though they might fire us for talking about Christ in the workplace because we know our job is not more important than our Savior. We share Christ with our neighbors because we love them and we want them to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, even though that means they might persecute us for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and telling them they have a need that they don't really understand. They are in desperate need of a Savior to pay for their sins. So we should go out and testify. We should share the gospel. But this is not meant to depress us this morning. This is meant to encourage us this morning. He's divine. We're the branches. We're connected to him. The power source comes through him. The Holy Spirit's job, one of its jobs, is to empower us as believers to be bold for the gospel of Jesus Christ because we know the world's going to be perse persecuting us in the process. They don't like the authority of God's word. They don't like the fact that we're no longer of this world and we seem very odd to them because we live for the things that they don't live for. And they do not want to hear us share the gospel with them. But hear me, we must. We have no other choice. See people with the eyes of God, love people the way God loves them and realize even if we see them as enemies sometimes, that God loves them and died for them. And if they don't come to know Jesus Christ, they're going to go to a real hell forever. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy to go to a real hell separated from God forever. So we must tell the world. And just be warned, persecution will come. But it's okay. Jesus says, they hated me, they're going to hate you. But it's okay, because one day we will no longer be in this world. We'll be in the new heaven that's going to take place in this new world that God's going to send to this earth, and it's going to be nothing like we see now. We talk about a glorious day, a day of rejoicing, a day that this lost world cannot understand until God saves them. So let's help them see the good news of Jesus Christ. Even though they hate us for it, let us stand on the word of God. Even though we're living in a world today who is watering down the word of God. If you come on Wednesday nights and hear me preach through Romans 8 and 9, that is a very controversial section of scripture. And I might even be persecuted by some people in the church for preaching that word. I'm just being honest. So do we back away from the Word of God? Do you apologize for the Word of God? Do you preach and say, I hope this doesn't offend you? It's the Word of God. It's His authority. Our job is just to share it and to learn it and to obey it even when we don't like His Word. My fleshly part of me would love to skip over Romans 8 and 9 and just go to Romans 10. But that wouldn't be obedient to God. That wouldn't be honoring the authority of the word of God. So I'm just telling you, if we live in a world today where sometimes you get persecuted in church for preaching the word, what do you think happens outside in the lost world in which we live? There are preachers today who cannot preach the word in fear that the church will persecute them for preaching the word. That tells you the sad day in which we're living spiritually I love you as your pastor I'm not a perfect person by any stretch of the imagination but I do seek to glorify God that's my heart's desire is to preach his word and to have people come to know Christ 
and for us to live even through persecution in a way that brings him honor and glory. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Help us, God, to have courage to live for you.